also recognize regional content possibly discounted. So, if it's made in Malawi, it counts 100% to the target. However, if it's made in Chipata, it counts 80%. So there's still an incentive to do it in Malawi, but we do recognize Zambia as being our brother stroke sister state. Then in Hansi, then there, we must balance using these, remember those are sticks, these are obligations. You want to sell to the state, you've got to do that. You want a license, you've got to do that. Those are sticks. We must balance sticks. You mustn't just beat the private sector. You must also have the carrots, very juicy carrots for them. And that's about the conducive environment, helping the private sector through good infrastructure, through project preparation, through cheap finance, developmental finance, help the private sector through reliable power, help the private sector through ability to export, through removing non-tariff barriers. So you mustn't just, as we in the past, we used to only use sticks and wonder why the private sector left and went somewhere else. So the private sector doesn't mind sticks as exist in China, lots of sticks, but then China has lots of very juicy carrots, so they come. Then, enhancing industry viability leverage through regional value chains. We cannot do this as little tiny countries, just economies of scale. You want to put in a nitrogenous fertilizer plant. Now, the availability of cheap nitrogenous fertilizers, as well as phosphatic and uh, potassium, but mainly nitrogen, would be the biggest single thing you could do to uplift Malawians. Because most Malawians are peasant farmers and the yields are dependent on fertilizers. At the moment, their soils are being depleted on an annual basis. At one point, Malawi was subsidizing against the World Bank advice, and it was very successful. So how do we get the economies of scale? What are your fertilizers? Of course, you make from natural gas. Shouldn't be working with Mozambique with 200 TCF or Tanzania with 60 TCF in the Ravuma Basin, working with them for a world-scale fertilizer plant. That was mooted for Dar es Salaam with Ferrostal and a Pakistani company and collapsed. But had that project known it would get the Malawi market and it would get the Zambian market and the DRC market, it would have gone ahead. Instead, we all want to put up world-scale fertilizer plots. But scales are enormous. So we need to club together, do fertilizer where it's cheapest. Where's the cheapest phosphate? Could be here. You've got carbonatite pipes like Palabora right here. I've forgotten the name. Kundulungu or something. Any case, you have a carbonatite pipe which has, that's low grade like Palabora, but has appetite, uh, P205. Um, so we have to join together because we don't all have everything like you don't have all the resources for industrialization in Malawi. Even South Africa, which is 1.2 million square kilometers, doesn't have everything. It doesn't have potassium for MPK, you know, the K in fertilizers, for instance. So if we join together, we have everything. So we end up, step five, manufacturing, industrialization, and creation of niche competitive advantages. So the mining in and earth moving and agricultural inputs advantages of North America you can see today in Caterpillar, right? Still there from the early days when they were at your, our stage of development. John Deere, all of these companies that started as part of the supply chain into bananas, mining and agricultural bananas. This is in the, the challenges I've done. 
and there are numerous viable investment projects along these. It's full of projects. The state will have several PFS facilities, often specific, so they can concentrate their skills. One will be for agri-processing, the other one might be um, for heavy engineering, etc. So I've got no problem with having Afri Exim Bank one, Asadok one, and even more. Export credit agencies, Sweden, only 10 million people, they got two. <laughs> Most African countries don't even have one. All of the 2063 vision and the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So mineral commodities, regional value chains, we're talking about the backward, forward, fiscal, knowledge, spatial and lateral linkages. Note that the mineral regional value chains are exactly or identical to the agricultural ones except the mineral ones are finite. The mineral ones will leave you with a hole in the ground. Will leave you with a mangura like Zimbabwe, Kabwe in Zambia, Stillfontein in South Africa. But agriculture's been going, as we know, in Iraq for 10,000 years, and it can go for another 10,000. Agriculture sustainable mining will leave you with a big hole in the ground. Okay, so this is the core slide. This is the value chain in minerals from exploration through to intermediate products ready to go into local manufacturing, agriculture, construction, power and other sectors. But as you can see, very little does. All of this leaks out into global value chains, goes overseas to be value added and comes back to us in the form of finished manufacturers. Then we have obviously to mine or to farm they will put in infrastructure. South Africa has, what, 30,000 kilometers of rail put in by what? Mainly gold mining. So mining, because of a high resource rent, can finance a lot of infrastructure. If you look at South Africa's electricity grid, its road grid, and its rail grid, it all radiates from Gauteng. It was built over 150 years to service mining. So you will get the infrastructure linkages, transport, power transmission, water, reticulation, ICT, communications, etc. Then you will get the consumption linkages. All the workers in that value chain are going to be buying things in supermarkets, they're going to be getting haircuts, they're going to be drinking in shabins, etc. It will stimulate economic activity. Then we have the fiscal linkages, which we do very badly. We mainly have foreign companies in mining, and we have illicit financial flows, enormous. And then illicit. Because we rely on foreign companies, it either goes out through dividends, or it goes there, out through transfer pricing. Then we have the knowledge linkages. We can't do this without investing in STEM skills. STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Hear me, not economics not philosophy, not history. If you want to develop, you need STEM. The economist Ha Jun Chang points out in not one of the tigers was there a single economist. Today in China, not a single economist is on the Central Econ Committee. Same in Korea, same in Taiwan, same in Japan. If you want to build a factory, don't ask an economist, he wouldn't know how. Get an engineer. He or she would know how to build a factory. So, what we need is STEM skills. We don't need, we need people who can create wealth, who can get out there, a fitter and turner. I don't just mean engineers, technicians. A fitter, I was told in Germany, their SMMEs don't come from engineers. They some guy working for Krupp who says, hey, I'm paying 80, they paying 80 euro for this, I can make it for 70. But why can he or she say that? Because he knows how to do it. So you must know how to turn something in a machine shop in order to set up a small company in your garage making that item. It's obvious. 
The next is lateral linkages. This is really important. Is once you can do the backward linkages, the supply chain into commodities, all the things that a farm or a mine needs, all the equipment, the capital goods, the consumables, the explosives, the fertilizers, the seeds, everything. Once you can do all of those, you can make capital goods for other sectors. So if you can do an ADT for earth moving, like Bell in South Africa, you can do that for mining. You can then get into other forms, or like Scania in Sweden started in mining and then got into commercial trucks where the market is 10 times bigger. You can migrate, that's called lateral linkages. Those skills are transportable and you then find them going all over. So an old mining processing company in the US, Imco, is now one of the biggest into bottled water. Because if you can clean up mining mess, you can make nice water into pet bottles to sell to people. <laughs> you take in the same technology, moving it into other markets. And then all of this happens in a national economy like Malawi, a national social, environmental and political context, in a continental context and in a global economy. So, what we've tried before is the socialism in one country. Remember Ujama in Tanzania? And then we found that couldn't work because we were too small. Even socialism, which is in one country, which was the old Soviet Union, it didn't work there, even though they had nearly all the resources. We need to join together and rely on each other. We need regional integration for the range of resources, feedstocks, and scale. But if we're going to do that, we need to configure instruments that cater for variable geometry, which is a funny term in SADC that we use for countries at different levels of economic development. So we need some method to level the playing field so it's just not South Africa that would benefit, that all the countries benefit. And that's essential. So we need interventions like the Afri Exim Bank that will favor the poorer countries, the less developed ones, to level the playing field for weaker regional economies so we can all benefit equitably. This was a friend of mine who's an agri-economist. He used my same diagram for agriculture. You can see it's almost exactly the same. The same linkages, the same value chains. It doesn't matter whether it's sugar or copper. <laughs> you have the same advantages. So the agriculture and mineral commodity linkages, value chains, opportunities are almost identical with numerous, I, don't, I was trying to think of a word, with immense investment projects. I'm talking about thousands. You would have several hundreds on one single value chain, say for, um, we were talking earlier, lithium ferrous phosphate batteries. Just that one has 32 value chains. Then you multiply by 100 minerals in the SADC. Now what do you got? 3,200. Now we move into agriculturals. We are talking about tens of thousands of projects all along the many value chains requiring project preparation. And the one is the AWPF. Um, they haven't told us how to say it. Do we say EPF? <laughs> so these are the advantages of Malawi. Agriculture, which we know because of your fantastic biomes, your different plateaus, in Nyika, Molangi, I used to live across the border. During the struggle, I was um, in, I was, as I said, in Mozambique, I was also in Molange, which is also a border on, on the border, but on the other side. Uh, forestry, especially in areas that aren't good for agriculture, broken terrain, and we have that. Aquaculture. Hmm? You know, you have the fifth largest freshwater body in the world, 700 meters deep, Lake Nyasa, Malawi. 
How can we use that enormous, you've got the biggest range of ornamental freshwater fish to send to the rich idiots who want to look at their little fish in the fish tanks. It's good, I shouldn't mock them, they can make money for us. Unfortunately, you can't beneficiate them much. <laughs> they beneficiate themselves by constantly evolving with more frills and looking more beautiful. Um, we have the catfish, we have the freshwater sardines, and of course, I can't not mention Chambu, the national fish of Malawi. However, I've got bad news. I've, I've read reports that aquaculture could be impacting on the natural harvesting, but that's a technical problem. We need life scientists, biologists, to say, how can we have both? We don't want to mess the lake, but we also want to farm like China does. 80% of fish eaten by the Chinese are farmed. They only rely 20% on plundering. While Europe, it's the other way around. 20% farmed, 80% plunder. Usually in other people's waters or some islands that they claim 200 miles or 350 kilometers around because they stuck their flag there. Um, all over the world, they've got those islands and fishing rights, like the Falklands, like Tristan de Cunha, like Bouvet, Kerguelen, like between us, uh, uh, between Mozambique uh, and uh, Madagascar, there are a whole lot of French who they claim because we didn't raise a flag. Although Mozambicans were there first, <laughs> but we didn't raise a flag. <laughs> so now it belongs to France. <laughs> and they now claim an area the size of Britain in rights. Because if you take pi r squared of 200 miles, it's about 400 thousand square kilometers, which is the size of Britain. So for each little point they claim, they take basically the size of um, Zimbabwe. Tonk, all over the world. The Americans all over the Pacific have claimed uh, stuff that's not theirs. Sometimes they blew it to pieces like Bikini Island testing atom bombs. Okay, so minerals, not big in Malawi, You've got coal, but coal's not looking good. The price is good, but the future's not good. You have uranium. That's good for the future, because it's uh, not global warming. Paladin in the north. Um, you have um, most of the other as occurrences. You have some of the commodity. I, I used to be a geologist. You've got the carbonatite pipes. I was doing geology on the other side, looking into coal and others in the grabens of that side. So you have a range, but that's a, those are dreams. Those are potentials, and we must facilitate those dreams through further exploration. Then rene RE, renewable energy sources. You are very well endowed. You have hydropower. I couldn't get accurate figures. The best I got was about a giga, you have a gigawatt potential, and you, you're putting in about 400 megawatts, mainly on the Shira, but there are, uh, there's a lot of micro hydro potential of smaller rivers running into the lake. And you have significant solar, massive bioenergy because of your rainfall and your biomes, and unquantified wind potential. I'm afraid I couldn't get data on wind potential for, for Malawi. And people don't often see tourism as a resource industry. I always argue our type of tourism isn't about going to play casinos and gamble in Las Vegas. It's about coming to see our fauna, our flora. It's about our resources. And these are our diverse fauna, flora, biomes. Geom people want to go up onto the Manji Plateau. Geomorphology. Our mountains, crags, you know, rivers, canyons, our cultures. Have we really sold? As I said, I used to love Muganda. Most Europeans have never seen that. They'd be really impressed. They come to see that. So tourism is resource-based, based on our natural resources.
whiskey. What's wrong with Malawi gin, right? Or local whiskey, for that matter. Leisure goods, garments, cultural goods. They want to go back with some ebony and some local carvings, local jewelry, and personal services, tourism, tourism. You know, they want massages and spas and things. So I'm saying that's another resource industry we unpack. Unfortunately, there's no downstream. You can't beneficiate a tourist any further than being a tourist. But there's massive supply chain opportunities. But there's not really um, forward linkages. If we look at solar, you can see you nearly the whole country is either medium to high solar. Enormous opportunities. But are we going to import all of those PV panels? Are we going to join together with South Africa, Zambia, especially Namibia, Botswana, who have the highest potential, to have regional plants? At the moment, South Africa is going alone. Why are we not working together? And as I said, unfortunately, we really in the past have only mined construction minerals. We mined some coal on the lake and we've mined some uranium. But there are, there's, 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 there are good indications that need to be followed up. These are your main feedstocks that we need to industrialize that are mineral. I'm not going to go through them all. They're obvious. They're not that many into manufacturing, power, construction, agriculture, and then produce a power which we don't have. But we see Botswana and Namibia, South Africa, using their producer power in diamonds to move the sorting from London, to move the polishing from Europe, Antwerp, Israel, and ultimately we hope to move the jewelry <laughs> where the labor is. We could also do that for cobalt, where we have over half the resources between DRC and Zambia. We, PGMs, we have 90% between Zambia and South Africa. Are we using producer power to leverage the value chains? To say, you want battery grade cobalt set up in our new SEZ on the border between Lubumbashi and Zambia at Kipushi. If you don't do that, you come second. We'll supply you after we've supplied those that are adding value. And they're not that many key feedstocks. These are them, and I've added to this list from the vision. As you can see, I've added the new RE ones, the lithium and the cobalt. You could add graphite, but you see, you can also get around that by, that's carbon, basically, you can also do that synthetically. And carbon is, of course, there in the form of coal, or you can have pet coke coming from oil. That's also the hydrocarbon, of course, is carbon-based. And these finally are going into where the jobs are, manufacturing, power, infrastructure, agriculture. The critical ones there for Malawi are the last ones, MPK. If you only remember one thing, it's MPK. How can we get cheap, requisite fertilizer to all Malawian farmers that would boost your economy faster than anything else, in my opinion. Your yields are dropping because every year nutrients are extracted and not put back. And yet in the region we have all of these nutrients. These are the different batteries I was speaking to gain more about the one that we are doing a study for SADC, and we're looking at, we're doing a study also for Africa, is the um, lithium ion phosphate, but then you can see there the, sorry, missed that one. You can see there the main minerals, aluminum, cobalt, copper, iron, um, lithium, manganese, nickel, um, binders, electrolytes, graphite, which I mentioned, fluoride, etc. All of those we could source. And again, put differently, we can see um, the whole range of the same minerals 
and uh, how they go into different types, into electric cars, conventional cars, and then into different types of renewable energy, wind, solar, nuclear, and then non-renewable energy, the naughty energy, coal and natural gas. I'm not, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to, uh, these are all the challenges, but I think we're all sick of hearing of the challenge, about the challenges. We know they're there, we've got to work on them, we've just got to start voting better in our countries, we've got to vote for governments that are going to tackle those challenges. <laughs> so, most, almost all of our countries in SADC are democratic, South Africa, we keep voting. Uh, I won't, I shouldn't say this, but we, we don't necessarily vote for those who are tackling the challenges. Instruments to build it. We need to leverage state resources. Rip, reciprocal recognition of regional value added back and forward linkages development. So we need to recognize right now local content law in Zambia treats something coming from Malawi as if it's coming from China. Does a Malawian look like a Chinese? Doesn't he look like a brother or sister? So we zero our neighbors and regional integration is meaningless. So we need in our local content laws to say we also credit something coming from our neighbors, but discounted. Not the same as we credited for our country, that's understandable, but to zero our neighbors, I really don't understand. So we need to have those requirements in the licenses. We need to recognize in the license leases, whatever it is. We need laws, regulations, licenses to cater for reciprocal recognition of regional value add, STEM skilling, and research and development. So if a company is using the SADC um, seed facility, I'm trying to remember its name, in Lusaka, in a project here, that should be recognized. We'd prefer them to use Lusaka than Nagasaki, right? Because they even speak to Chewa there. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying we need to recognize the region, and if we all do it, we all benefit. But we need to do it in a way that helps the weaker countries. Cost-efficient strategic commodities, key flood stocks I've covered, regional financing for this. We need both the pre-feasibility studies. There is a problem I raised, is when we did this on the regional development corridors 20 years ago, it's no use going to a full feasibility study for the private sector. They're not going to believe your numbers. They're going to, if I'm a private sector investor and there was an Afro Exim Bank thing, I say, oh, it looks very nice, but I'm going to redo every number. I wouldn't be a good in entrepreneur if I didn't. But for infrastructure projects, we have to do it all the way to full feasibility because that's a state asset. You're putting it out for a BOT, build, operate, transfer. It's a concession. So there you must do the full study before you concession. Also, so you know what the value of that piece of infrastructure is in terms of the revenue streams going forward. But what we used to do for industrial projects, value chain projects, is what we call the scan. It's a pre-feasibility pre study or what we called a IIRR, an indicative internal rate of return, and we called it a taster, just to show broadly the project's viable, because we knew the private sector investor is going to redo all our numbers. Then a very important one, we must build local capital. If we use foreign capital, they will not build these linkages. We know global experience shows foreign capital do not build linkages. Transnational com companies have global purchasing. They're not going to build a local supply chain. They purchase globally. 
I'm not knocking them. What they're doing is good for their shareholders. But local capital, like in Nigeria, Dangote, local capital build the linkages. What no countries developed on FDI. China selectively brought FDI into manufacturing, but not resources. No, they said, no, 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 our resources are for Chinese. And that's what Finland, you couldn't get an exploration license in Finland if you weren't a Finn. Sweden the same, Germany the same. They said, no, our resources we can develop, thank you very much, but come with your manufacturing so we can copy you. That's clever. K-L-V-A, clever. That's a slang word in South Africa. Clever is what the Chinese, come Mr. Mercedes Benz with your OEM. But the tier one suppliers had to be majority Chinese. They knew in five years, strange named copies would start appearing that we'd never heard of. GWN, Great Wall Motor Motors, Geely, all these, bike, you know. Very clever. So come with your technologies. But resources, we can do it. We don't have to bring in Ilovo from London. Malawi can do a sugar plantation. Come on, let's get real. And if not Malawi, you can do it with Zambia. Why are we bringing in European companies? So we need to, in all these licenses, it's too late, you're going to chase away capital if you suddenly change like Zimbabwe did and said 51% local. No. At the beginning of any license or concession, you say, on renewable, 51% local. No one's going to walk away. Because in 25 years, they're going to make their money back many times over. Their business plan will seldom go beyond seven years. So it's not going to chase FDI away. But then it's up front. You don't shock the system. They all know it's going to happen. They start developing local partners. And by the end of the concession, they got buddies locally, and it will become 51% local. That, I think, can work. Indigenization is not crazy nationalism. Indigenization is essential to build the supply chains. Foreigners will not do it. And also, with foreigners, you get massive illicit financial flows, as we know bigger than the total, right, FDI and ODA, according to the AFTB study. So all of the FDI in Africa and all of the overseas development assistance is less than the illegal financial flows flowing back to the same countries. I rest my case. <laughs> Trade facilitation, I'm not going to, people have covered that. Logistics facilitation is absolutely vital. I once saw a study of fertilizer unloaded in Beira in bulk, and, by the, and the cost was four times by the time it got to a farmer in Malawi. That's going to kill that farmer. So we need those corridors, the Nakala Corridor, and even maybe the old colonial Zambezi River Corridor. And I saw an announcement that President Nuse, they're opening up the spur at Villa de Nova Frontera to the Bay Road. These need to become seamless and dirt cheap. We need to move Malawi to the coast. If we can get the cost per ton, kilometer down to two American cents. We effectively are moving Malawi to Nakala. That was the Chinese strategy. So we really must work with Mozambique to have really efficient, cheap corridors to make all of these things possible. And then we need to leverage the energy transition to also build. Yes, we have solar. How can we leverage that to be building solar installations, factories, etc., and also maybe using that to make hydrogen, which we can then export to the world as a clean fuel? 
through reverse of a fuel cell, taking water, adding electricity and getting hydrogen and oxygen compressed. That's going to be a big market going forward in the world. That hydrogen you can then use to make steel instead of using coal or coke. You can use that obviously to burn. You can use that to run ships, anything. I won't go through these. These are just quotes. Regional strategies are vital. This is just graphically, we have a whole lot of countries, each with different resource bases. Each one has limit, limited possibilities. But if we all join together, we have a massive market and all of the inputs or critical feedstocks that we need. Then the last, my last point is how do we cater for variable geometry? This is um, taken from the uh, SADC mining vision is we need regional local content recognition discounted at the inverse of GDP per capita. So that means the richer countries will count less as local content and the poorer countries more. So for a project in Zambia, a product from Malawi will count 90% but coming from Mauritius or South Africa will count 50%. So we start balancing. We start disadvantaging the richer countries to uplift the poorer countries. Regional development funds where Afri-Exim banks come in, but we need them focused on that supply chain. So we believe there should be a special VCF for equity, debt, and PFSs on your commodity up and downstream projects, but not the commodity project. They don't need them. So not a farming project, but a project to process sugar into confectionery, for instance. We need a logistics equalization mechanism. There are some countries where the minister in Namibia said, how can we play in this game? It's so difficult for us to get in. And Angola, there's no rail link. How do you take goods from here to Luanda? You'd get onto the rail, which is only half operating, through the Copper Belt to Lubito. Then you've still got to get Lubito by roll road up to Luanda. We are not connected. So we need some method of plugging those gaps. So that mechanism must help those producers say in Lubito trying to come into the copper belt market. How do we assist them so we level the playing field? So they can compete as someone in the Kala can compete. Then we, I must admit, I'm weakest on the logistics thing. I'd love ideas, but we need to tackle it. All things aren't equal. How does someone in Lozeland, in Western Zambia, compete in Blantai? How do we somehow equalize that? Not equalize, but assist that. It will never be equal. And finally, within a common external tariff, we still need infant industry protection for countries that are like Malawi that are just starting out. That means we allow them to put up a tariff, but only for the debt, because when Malawi invests in a new plant, they pay in the banks for five to seven years, right? So for that time, they've got extra costs against an established producer, say, in Harare. So for that time, they should be allowed a small tariff, not more than 10% but not longer than seven years, because that debt, even seven years, you can, you're a banker, you're not going to get seven years, with meager maybe, but you're not going to get seven years. Commercial, you'll get five years max. Um, and we use that protection only on those commodity value chains, not for farming or mining, but only for industry down, industry up. And this is from the regional mining vision, and it shows how it would work. So you would recognize here 
local content from Angola at 73% of the value that you'd recognize in Malawi at 100%. But we now don't relegate our neighbors to nothing. We discount it, but we still recognize them. This is the only route we came through, and the ministers have agreed with us. This was 2019. They haven't, as usual, we haven't implemented it. But this is, this is one idea. If you have better ideas, please, we'd love to hear your ideas. But we need mechanisms so that if we join together, we don't get like what happened with Mercosur, where Brazil took all of the opportunities. And that started pissing off Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay. It was not zero sum. Remember, those opportunities displaced foreigners. But we're a jealous bunch, aren't we? We don't want to see our neighbor benefiting more than us, even though they're displacing maybe China and Japan. But at the same time, let's recognize our jealousy and say, yeah, we need mechanisms so it doesn't all accrue to the, the more advanced countries. So this is what we proposed. Uh, the GDP per capita is out of date because that was from the regional mining vision. That's easily updated. So in one picture, what we need is a common outer tariff for these lines, the down and upstream. Up to 10%, we don't want that tariff to be too distortionary. Right? So inputs into farming and mining, up to 10, I'd set it at 10%, because you get dumping. Like Gainmore was talking about steel. Right now we're getting steel dumped on us. Then we need regional mining and processing and farming back and forward linkage development strategy, which we're putting forward. Regional local content, so I've, I've just repeated everything here. And finally, uh, also STEM skilling where we recognize our neighbors. So in every mining license, like in South Africa, 5% of payroll must be on skilling. But we must also allow them to use universities in other countries. If there's a university in Zambia that's really good at agriculture, or sugar, or sweet sorghum, I know they're doing a lot of research, we should also recognize that, also discount it. So you want to use Zambia, that's fine. We'll give you 80% credits. But if you use Blantyre, you get 100%. Conclusions. I think I've gone through all of them. We have enormous comparative advantages for all of the feedstocks which we need for industrialization, development, growth, sustainable development and equitable growth. Private sector access to all of these resources which belong to our people needs to be dependent on developing the value chains, local content, localization and downstream value addition. And it needs to be reasonable. So they need to have targets in the license, in the mining license. You will be at X in five years, at Y in 10 years, 15 years, that are doable. And you put those out to auction so you, no one can come back and say, these are too tough. You say to the companies, what can you do? You know, sharpen your pencils. What's your best offer? So instead of auctioning against value, you auction against development. We need to use state purchasing power across the region. We should even be thinking of joining together with other states when we purchase in bulk because we get better prices and we can demand more value addition. So if the government of Malawi is going to be buying tractors and the government of Zambia and Tanzania are going to be buying tractors, why don't we join all of our orders together and then tell the tractor companies now which one of you is going to put a plant in that's going to be more than 60% local content so that it benefits from the Africa free trade area. With those kind of volumes, 
they would really become, they would be coming in. And they would be, even, if necessary, even putting in the steel plant to make the steel to cost the engine blocks for those tractors. Or even though they, they're not engine blocks, by then they'll most probably be electric motors with lithium batteries, hopefully. <laughs> and finally, we need to balance the carrots and sticks. We need affordable capital and affordable utilities, water, power. We need much lower logistics costs. Malawi is one of the worst in the world, the LPI, your logistics performance in index, mainly because of being landlocked. We need trade facilitation, Afri Exim Bank, and we more need Malawi doing it as well. And then we need project preparation, such as we're talking about today. And that is. I think I've run out of, I've got a reminder here, time. I think I've run out of time. So we recommend a resource-based industrialization strategy for the region, not just mining, but also agri-commodities. That builds on the, doc the documents we've already signed but never implemented. We need to use the whole global warming to our advantage, not only to get cheaper energy from the sun, from wind, from hydro, or even nuclear, from renewable sources, but we need to use this to kickstart manufacturing. And we can't wait for the whole of the SADC to agree, because you might then be waiting for the second coming of some religion. I think we need to start now. Unilaterally, bilaterally, trilaterally with our neighbours. Let's start doing it. But particularly, I would suggest you need to work with Mozambique. Maybe learn to fala português. Quem fala português aqui? Ninguém. No one speaks Portuguese here. Malawians, we, we need somewhere, we mustn't always demand the Mozambicans just learn English. Right? But you need to work with Mozambique. I would certainly say you are pretty limited in your opportunities if you don't have a close um, sibling relationship with Mozambique. I'm not saying they're easy or not to work with or whatever. I'm not saying you are easy or not to work with. All I'm saying, for the good of the people of both countries, you need to be working as if there wasn't a border. I am... Where am I on time, Zito? Finished. Sorry, I had a few more slides, but I'm not going to do them because I'm out of time. FDI, I've said, doesn't work. FDI, be careful. Bazopa. <laughs> you will not get the linkages. And you will lose the surplus. Um, there's the logistics constraint. And then I go into how do we reactivate the old Nakala development corridor and the Beira and Chindi corridors. How do we get them flowing again to lower costs? so we can get things into Malawi, out of Malawi, as cheap as damn possible. And then I go into this, and that's it. And then, Zikomo Kwambiri. Obrigado. So, I'm um, over to the next one. Thank you very much. Um, next is going to be another presentation by um, Zito and then uh, uh, Mr. Chanza. Just a reminder to our presenters to stick to the 30 minute uh, time limit, please. Thank you.
this is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, uh, my presentation, basically, I'm going to unpack how the joint project preparation facility came about and our collaboration with the Export Development Fund. I'm going to talk about its rationale and what we're trying to achieve and the key takeaways of our, of our particular intervention. Uh, so first and foremost, I'm going to start off with some statistics. Uh, as we're all aware, in 2015, the African Development Bank identified that Africa has an infrastructure gap of about 130 to 170 billion dollars per annum. Now, this was even before COVID and the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Thank you. Okay. Now, in light of the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement and the COVID pandemic, what we've seen is that the infrastructure gap has increased significantly. Secondly, what we also noticed with regard uh, to the report that we've seen from UNCTAD is that having an infrastructure gap is one thing, but over and above that, you also need investments that will ride on that infrastructure so that we can facilitate trade. And the UNCTAD report highlights that we need about $485 billion per annum in order to ensure that we can sweat out these investments and unlock uh, development impact for our member countries. What, we also noted, what we've also noted is that from the World Bank report that was prepared in 2021 is that for Malawi in particular to crowd in investments in the infrastructure sector with a focus on energy and water, you need about $7.6 billion over the next 10, 15 to 20 years. That's about three to $400 million. When you do some analysis, what you realize is that having this infrastructure is good, but you also need investments. So what that means is that Malawi needs about $20 billion over and above the energy gap, the water gap, which does not even mention transport and logistics. So what you quickly realize is that the government, as has been stated by the Minister of Finance, does not have sufficient capacity. Why? Because they're competing interests. The government has to bridge some of the gaps that it faces. And when you look at this particular slide, I'd like to point out two particular factors. Now, this is a slide that we've seen many times from McKinsey International, and it shows the project development value chain. So typically, when a project developer is coming up with an idea or a concept, they assess the environment within which they operate. So they'll look at Malawi and say, what are the legal and regulatory frameworks within which they operate? They'll then define the project to understand what particular sectors and what opportunities are present. Then they'll then undertake a feasibility study, structure the project, and then bring it to a financial institution such as a Frexin Bank or EDF for financing. So what you, what you quickly realize is that most financial institutions sit on the back end of that particular intervention. So what they do is that they actually wait for a developer or sponsor with the technical and financial wherewithal to bring a project through all these four stages. What we see from the statistics is that only one in 10 projects on average make it to be financed by a potential financial institution. Now, this also brings me back to the Africa infrastructure paradox. Because when you read the World Investment Report, what you realize is that globally, there's about $100 trillion of investment funding sitting with pension funds, institutional investors, and sovereign wealth funds. These are funds that are available for any well-structured or packaged project that can be tapped into. A typical example is what we saw in 2020 with the Mozambique LNG project. This was the biggest project that Africa has ever done, $24 billion. And in that particular project, because it was well-structured and packaged, this project was able to attract international funding. What that tells us is that developing projects that are bankable, that risks are well identified and mitigated, definitely can crowd in investments. But this project, what no one tells is that this project took about 10 to 12 years to be developed. 10 to 12 years to develop a $24 billion project. Not many of us have the patience to go through that kind of heavy lifting. So what we at Afrexin back did was, we looked at this particular slide and we said, what can we as a developer institution do to unpack and fast track the continent's economic development? 
And we realized that the key challenge is right here at the feasibility stage, at this 20% drop. So what we did was we opened it up and we saw what the key challenges were. So three key things happen at the feasibility stage. So first and foremost, your typical developer or sponsor at times does not have the capacity to assess projects. They do not know where to identify consultants that can prepare solid, robust, bankable business plans. Or even if they do, they do not have the financial resources to finance those studies. For example, a complex uh, project finance transaction in the hydropower sector, a typical environmental social impact assessment report can range from anything from three to $400,000 to even $1.5 million. So those costs can be quite prohibitive. The other thing that we noticed was that even when we come across developers and sponsors who know where to get the technical expertise, they know where and they have the funding. At times, they do not have the ability to engage with government. As we all know, you have to work within the laws of the country within which you operate. So we at Frexin Bank identified that given the fact that uh, Malawi and other member countries are our shareholders, we have a very good relationship within which we can step in handhold our clients and take them to the various ministries so that we can ensure that the right policies, the right regulatory frameworks are put in place so that we can get to bankability. So we saw an opportunity that instead of a Frexin Bank sitting at the trans transaction support stage whereby you're waiting with everyone else, arms folded, for a transaction to come through the value chain and only one in turn will come through, why not take the risk? Why don't you understand what this cycle is about? Move upstream handhold them and bring more projects to bankability. What we see when we do that is this particular slide, which is very enlightening, and this is the primary thrust of project preparation and why we established a project preparation facility in our Frexin Bank. What we saw was that when you intervene in the project preparation phase during the feasibility stage and you provide funding, you provide access to technical consultants and you facilitate engagements with the government and the public sector, the likelihood of projects getting to bankability increases so much more. What we saw was that from a ratio of one in 10 projects getting to bankability, that ratio increases to at least, from out of 10 projects to four to five projects. So for example, if there were 100 ideas in Malawi, in a typical year, you'll have had 10 projects. With a project preparation facility, out of 100 projects, you'll have at least 40 to 50 projects being brought. Remember what I said about the infrastructure paradox. We've got investors who are waiting to support these projects. So all we have to do is bridge that gap, package these transactions, and unlock this development impact. So what exactly is a project preparation facility? A project preparation facility is basically a tool. It's a trade enabler. Essentially, it's a product that comes in, works with developers and sponsors to de-risk a project. How does it do that? First and foremost, you look at various components of a particular project. You look at the sponsor's capacity. Do they have the capacity to implement that project? Do they have the technical skills to assess the project? The market, the operations, the environmental impact assessment, the legal and regulatory frameworks. So you look at a project from those six key areas and then identify solutions to each particular facet. Now, these are skills that normally most developers and sponsors, unfortunately, on the continent do not have the capacity to do that. A Frexin Bank is in a position to step in and bridge some of these gaps. So the fund was essentially established to provide technical services and financial services, and of course, trade facilitation support, as I mentioned. The joint project preparation facility that we established with our EDF, this collaboration commenced in 2020, and essentially, it was born out of the fact that a Frexi bank on its own cannot bridge the project preparation gaps. We estimate the project preparation gaps at between 5 to 10 percent of our, our total project investment cost, assuming the infrastructure gap of 130 billion dollars. That's about 6.5 billion dollars per annum. Definitely, a Frexi bank does not have the capacity to bridge those gaps. So what we did is we came up with an innovative idea, which is a joint project preparation facility, a first-of-a-kind intervention, whereby a Frexin Bank is partnering in-country with various financial institutions to establish project preparation facilities. And we're rolling this out across all member countries. And we started off with EDF. And what we're doing in this particular instance is that a Frexin Bank and EDF have pooled resources under our first pilot phase and I'm sure you've all heard today about the two industrial parks in Malawi, and those are our pilot projects. 
we've pooled resources and we're developing those projects together. Now, under this particular intervention, what you can see is we can actually, we intend to scale this intervention up so that we can support more institutions or SPVs. So this can be scaled up. We've demonstrated proof, of course, that which we've done through the industrial parks. In terms of sectors of intervention, in this particular, uh, particular area with, uh, with EDF, we're looking at logistical, parks, logistical platforms, that is industrial parks. We're looking at agro-processing, light manufacturing, services and extractives. Again, building on what Dr. Jordan said, we're leveraging off Malawi's comparative advantages because that is what will make them be competitive. The services that are provided under this joint pre preparation facility are four. So first and foremost, we finance the preparation of bankable and feasibility studies. These are your environmental impact assessment reports, financial models, market studies, uh, information memorandums, the full suite of documentation that you typically would require to be put in place before you can submit them to a financial institution, such as EDF or a Frexin Bank. The second thing that we do is we support the procurement of transaction advisors. This could be legal, technical, or financial in nature. We also support the procurement of project managers because we are cognizant of the fact, and in our experience in the continent, is that we do come across developers and sponsors who are keen to diversify their portfolios and invest into particular sectors which is not their niche. However, they don't have the expertise, so we, we're able to engage project managers who can step in on their behalf and oversee the development of some of these projects. We also support last mile activities in form of fundraising and marketing expenses. It's one thing to have a detailed financial model and an information memorandum and a data room to present to us. When you approach financial institutions for senior debt funding, there are certain costs associated with that exercise. There are facility fees, there are appraisals. A Freximac, again, is happy to support that. What that does is it ensures that we can close out that financing gap, provide these technical advisory services so that more projects, again, can get to bankability. And that's what we're doing with EDF. So who are the typical JPPF partners that we target across the continent? Uh, so first and foremost, we can partner with government, PPPs, or the private sector. All we're looking for or targeting is investors who are searching for impact, development impact. So there needs to be that alignment. We support projects that are greenfield and brownfield in nature. So anyone coming up with a new idea or concept that's unique, we're more than happy to have a look at those projects. If there's an existing project that needs to be scaled up, again, it's an, it's an opportunity for us to engage. Eligibility sectors are primarily broken down into two broad windows. We've got what we call the trade enabling infrastructure window, and typically the transactions that we support here are under energy. This could be renewable or thermal power energy sources, transport and logistics, 